Hey folks, welcome back. This is uh, the fourth installment in the series, short series I'm doing on kind of how to start reading a birth chart, sort of like where to start and whatnot. And uh, in this video, I'm going to talk a bit about the moon. Um, I'm pick up where I left off last time and whatnot, but talk more about the moon, which is very important in the starting point of the chart. And also talk about the sect light, which is important too. Um, if you haven't already, please hit like, please hit subscribe more importantly, and then you know, please uh, be willing to share this video if you like it, and check out my website if you're interested in individualized readings and more. Also find me on Facebook at Heavenly Branches Astrology and, um, and or my personal profile, Lars Panaro. All right, so in the previous videos, we spent an awful lot of time uh, talking about the Ascendant Lord, the Ascendant Mars, a little bit of the Sun, a little bit of Mercury, talked a little bit about the ninth house just for fun, and even a lot of fortune. And I didn't say this in the last videos, but the lot of fortune is, is in a day chart, the distance from the sun to the moon, and then projected from the ascendant. And in a night chart, you reverse that. So you start with the moon, go to the sun, and project that from the ascendant. And a lot of fortune is basically like the lunar ascendant, the lot of spirit, which is the opposite calculation, is like the solar ascendant. These are special points that actually have a lot of importance in classical systems of astrology. But uh, for more for more than that, I will have to do another video, which I probably will eventually do. But yeah, the moon is super important to take a look at. In fact, sometimes I look at the moon first over the Ascendant Lord or the Ascendant or anything. And in fact, while a lot of people uh, in the West have a hard time with this, I've noticed, um, oftentimes reading the chart from the moon can be just as accurate, if not more accurate than reading it from the ascendant, which is amazing because the moon <clears throat> is um, basically deals with our thoughts and feelings on a more basic level. It's considered to be the kind of lower mind or just like that, the personality self. So you know, because our thoughts create a reality in a very big way, um, reading the chart from the moon as an ascendant, right? Just saying, okay, Taurus is the first house here, and then Gemini will be the second and so on, can really give us quite a lot of information. And in more advanced techniques, you can even read it from the lot of fortune, from the lot of spirit, and even the sun. And they all have subtly different things to, to tell us about the person's life and whatnot. And I may do that a bit here in some of these videos, but for now, let's just focus on the moon. So first thing is always is what sign is it in? What house is it in? Well, it's in Taurus. It's exalted. So basically it's in very good condition. That's nice. It's in the third house where it experiences joy. Joy is um, kind of a subtle technique, uh, again, from Hellenistic astrology. Uh, all you need to know about that is that planets in their joy, um, it's kind of like a, a special place where they sort of get a bit of a boost. Now, the nice thing about this moon, though, is that it's in its joy, but it's not cadent, meaning that if we were to revert back to a quadrant uh, version of what's going on, which I won't do at the moment, but we would find that the moon is actually... Uh, basically in the second quadrant based house, which means that it's quite strong in terms of the astronomical reality. So this is a uh, quite a powerful moon in that sense. And uh, overall in pretty good condition, uh, it's not getting a, a close opposition from any planet and it's not getting a, um, a close square from any planet either. The one thing that maybe is a little bit challenging about it is it is uh, square the nodes, even though it's square out of sign. The nodes are kind of an exception to the rule, in my opinion, and so it is uh, at the bends of the nodes, but it is leaving that, that region, and it will leave it uh, fairly soon. So I don't want to give too much credence to that at this point. I want to just say it's, it's, it's a moon that's in pretty good condition. So immediately what this tells us about the person um, is that they're going to have a fairly stable, firm mind, which is crucial for 
whatever the rest of the chart shows to be able to manifest. Because if the moon is not in good condition, then the person can have an extremely hard time in life. And it will negatively affect everything else in the chart because their mind will be unstable. Their mind will be unsteady, okay? But this is a person who has a third house, joyous, strong by um, quadrant houses, moon, and by dignity, right? It's also in the, the, the bound of Venus, and it's, it's waxing, too, which, um, which, is, uh, which makes it more, you could say, more benefic in the sense that it, it, it means the person is going to be um, um, more optimistic, more of a builder of things rather than a sort of demolisher of things, which is like the waning moon. Uh, just again, we're being very general here. Very general. Okay, so now that we've done that, we've determined the moon's pretty good. Next, we want to see what uh, planets it separates from and applies to. So the last aspect, what was the last aspect that the moon would have had? Well, it would have been in another sign. So if we take the moon back into Aries, the last aspect looks like it was with the sun. So it's separating from a trine with the sun, which is actually, you know, a, a beneficial aspect, generally speaking. And what is it applying to? Well, it's not going to apply to Mercury or Jupiter. It could apply to Saturn and it could apply to Venus. It looks like it will apply to Saturn. So it will aspect Saturn next. So it's going from sun to Saturn. Um, Saturn is in fairly good condition, but I also want to check his 12th part because by 12th part, he's in Aries. So he actually ends up being kind of in questionable, questionable condition because of that actually. But I won't be talking about 12th parts too much here. Um, so the, the, the positive thing here though, is that, uh, even though Saturn is, uh, occidental, meaning he's about to, uh, meaning he would rise after the sun rose. This is a weakening factor for those of you who don't know. There's a couple weakening factors on him, even though he's in Capricorn, his own sign, right? The, the Occidental thing, the, the fact that he'll be subsumed by the sun soon, that's weakening. And um, the fact that he's in Aries is, is, is um, kind of a negative influence. So it's, it's just kind of an interesting situation here where the moon goes from sun to Saturn. And, um, Basically, uh, this gives us sort of a, a very general way to look at what the person came in to the world with in terms of their mentality and their like behavioral patterns, their main behavioral patterns, thought patterns and stuff versus how, what they are going towards what they tend to approach the future with kind of a thing. And it's a little hard for me to cook up an interpretation for this, to be honest. Um, in horary, this is a lot easier to deal with in natal astrology. It's a lot more general. Um, I'm not going to lie. It's not, it's not something that's my forte, but it, I, it is something I always observe. And so basically what I would say here is that luckily it's a waxing moon which is um, the waxing moon does better with Saturn. And luckily it's an exalted moon too. So it ha has the ability to hold its own, but it's almost as though the person is coming from a place where they have felt a lot of like power and purpose and whatnot naturally. Um, and the way they kind of approach their future is through maybe a more burdensome limiting mentality, Saturnic mentality, right? So they may be somebody who, um, as they approach things, they, they take them very seriously. They take them to be very, um, they just approach, yeah, they just approach things like very, very seriously is, uh, the best way for me to put it. And these aspects are also going to be important if we ever want to interpret like the person's career stuff and life direction. So I, I just think it's important to, to note these things in the beginning, even though we're not getting something super clear from them. Um, we also get, you know, 
it's kind of like a familiarity versus unfamiliarity. So again, like the person with the moon, um, uh, it's, it's, it, it's separating from the sun, right? So they're familiar with solar things. Sun rules the fifth and a lot of fortune. They may be somewhat familiar with these things. These are just sort of talents and skills maybe that they just have under their belt. And then the stuff with Saturn, right? That stuff they're going to more tenaciously go after. And so it can actually mean a lot of success and stuff, but it also means something a little less familiar to the person. So, and again, we look at the rulerships too, right? Saturn rules the 11th house. So that's like friends and hopes and wishes and gains. And the 12th house, which is loss, sorrow, expenditures, uh, loneliness, isolation, and also surrender and letting go. So, um, so those are all things that you can take into account and look at to see broader patterns in the person's life. And then you can look at those again more closely um, and see if they repeat in any other ways. We're not going to do that right now, but I just wanted to point out that's kind of the way you want to just look at the moon briefly. And then, like I mentioned before, you can look at, um, you can look at uh, the, you can read the chart from the moon and compare it to the testimony from the ascendant. So reading the chart from the moon, if we look at the 10th house, we don't have a strong 10th house from the moon, right? Saturn, the Lord is cadent from that house, which is not, not bad by any means, actually. Um, in this situation, it can be quite auspicious. <clears throat> However, that 10th house isn't quite getting the same hit that it's getting here from the ascendant. Furthermore, this house is buffeted by three rather malefic planets. It, well, if we include the south node, that is. So two if we don't, right? So this 10th house from the moon is not, again, not quite as supported, right? So that could mean that that could actually change the interpretation we gave earlier about the person's 10th house and could give us some more insight. Maybe this person has all this potential, but they squander it for some reason because from their moon, their mind, that 10th house isn't really getting much support. And so therefore, in a sense, it's not really uh, something that they have an easy time sustaining mentally and emotionally and even physically because the moon, our, our mind emotions that the moon symbolizes affects our body directly, which is why the moon also has to do with the body. Okay, so yeah, just pointing that out real quick. And then um, I said I wanted to look at um, reading from the sect light. Well, reading from the sect light, um, the sun is the sect light. Sect, again, is day or night. This chart is a day chart because the, simply because the sun is above the horizon axis, right? So this would be up in the sky in the area the person was born and be daytime. So in a night chart, we look at the moon. In a, um, in a, uh, a day chart, we look at the sun. And we do something very simply where, you know, we just check to see what condition it's in. It's in decent condition because it's angular, right? But it's square to Mars. So that kind of Mars it a little bit. And then if we look at the 12th parts, we find that sun moves into Libra, which is its fall, which really weakens it quite a bit and also places it in the malefic eighth house, which is a dark house. So that kind of Mars, these things are kind of marring the, the otherwise good looking nature of the sun that we talked about in the previous videos. <clears throat> so very important to see that, but disregarding all that, uh, disregarding the sun as being whatever, looking at him as the sect light for a moment, the sect light has a lot to do with the basis of the nativity, how strong of a foundation the nativity has, how, um, and it kind of shows, um, it gives us something general to look at in the person's life. And so the next step is, if you don't already know this technique, you'll need to look it up. It's called Dorotheus Triplicity Lords. D-O-R-T-H-E-U-S. See if I can find it real quick. Doroth Dorothean triplicity rulers. Should find it pretty quick. And so um, it, the triplicities are, are pretty simple. Um, right during the day, 
these planets rule fire during the night, this is the order, okay? And so what this gives us is, first of all, sun in our chart is in a fire sign, Sagittarius, okay? And um, so we, and it's a day chart. So we know the first ruler of triplicity is the sun, the second is Jupiter, and the third Saturn. And I've modified this technique a little bit because I think it makes sense. I do it based on Saturn returns. So from zero to the first Saturn return is the first triplicity. From first Saturn return to the second is the second, and so on for the third. So um, let me get back to um, let me get back to the chart real quick. Okay, back to the chart here. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so our first triplicity lord is the sun. And what does that mean? I didn't really explain what that means. I'm sorry. It means that basically the triplicity lords are going to rule those segments of life I explained based on the Saturn return. So you look at all three to see if they're well placed, right? If most of them are well placed, two out of three, then we have a strong foundation for generally success in life, in, in the affairs of life. Um, so Sun is the first triplicity Lord. He is strong by virtue of being in an angle, right? But he's kind of marred by these other things we pointed out earlier. Okay, so it's kind of like a middling, it's sort of like a middling condition. The first third of this person's life would probably be marked by a lot of battles and conflicts, frustrated ambitions. Um, Mars square the Sun can also bring uh, problems for the father as well. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, just generally speaking, some difficulties there. Second triplicity Lord is Jupiter and the third is Saturn. Well, we already talked about Saturn and Jupiter, right? Jupiter overall is in pretty good condition. So the second third of the life is naturally supported overall by and large. It's going to be a more productive period of life. The last period, Saturn, again, he's in a good house, but he's in somewhat of a um, precarious condition. So again, we just, we have to take that to within the context of things. In, in the last third of life, so to speak, the person will be dealing with Saturnian kind of issues and life circumstances. And there will probably be a mixture of, um, a mixture of strength and weakness, right? So, I mean, I would say overall, the person's triplicity lords are um, kind of like, weak to middling in a sense. Like I, I would say like middling to strong, not quite because again, Jupiter is cadent. The sun is afflicted and Saturn is sinking into the rays of the sun. So it's kind of like weak to middling. Okay. So that's going to affect the general tenor of the nativity and what the person can accomplish on a psycho spiritual level. Um, predictive techniques like this are, can give us a lot of insight into sort of like what is directing the person's life at that time. And what I've generally noticed with the triplicity Lords is that it's not that their testimony is set in stone, right? Cause it always has to be compared to other testimonies so we can see if there's confluence or not, but it just shows like what is kind of directing and drawing the life. And um, the house placement of the triplicity Lord is very important. The uh, dispositor of the triplicity lord is also very important too. So we analyze it just like we'd analyze anything else. And basically, um, you know, in the first part of life, right, ambitions and public life and things are going to be a big center stage for this person. In the second period of life, right, we still have an emphasis on public life and whatnot, but now it's kind of things have kind of receded and calmed down a bit for whatever reason. And maybe there's more focus too on um, uh, private life and inner world, fourth house and partnerships, marriage and stuff uh, because Mercury is with that triplicity Lord. And then Saturn in the third period, Saturn, Saturn is getting a sextile from Venus and a wide trine from the moon like we talked about. And Saturn's in the 11th, which again has to do with gains and um, 
um, friendships and things. So we may have a lot of things around friendships, maybe the death of friends or something like that, if we were being more predictive, which I tend to not do, but I can't help but see these things, of course. Um, so yeah, Saturn, uh, 12th house in the 11th is kind of difficult for friends, difficult for gains and so on. Um, uh, Saturn being aspected closely by Venus will tell us something too, right? Venus is going to add her rulership of the third, her rulership of the uh, eighth, and her natural rulerships and so on. And we would just keep examining it to see kind of like what we what we got from that and so on. Um, this could easily be some kind of inheritance or legacy kind of thing. Anyway, so... Um, so again, these are just really good general techniques for getting a feel of the basis of the nativity. Uh, the last technique I wanted to mention real quick is examining again the lot of fortune and briefly just reading the chart from the lot as an ascendant. So we would take Leo as the ascendant and we would find that, you know, the Lord is in a strong place from the, from the lot of fortune. Um, co-present, meaning in the same sign, though not conjunct with Jupiter and Mercury, two very beneficial planets. A lot of fortune is close to the node, um, which actually could be empowering for the lot, even if a bit destabilizing. But the thing I wanted to draw your attention to is the fact that the lot, the tenth from the lot of fortune is very, very good because it has the moon exalted there very good for that uh, 10th house stuff. So even though the 10th from the moon is not so great, the 10th from the lot of fortune is quite great. And the lot of fortune is not necessarily somehow like a more valid or more accurate place to read from than the moon, but it tends to show how things, it's a combination of the moon and the ascendant in a sense. So it sort of brings those things together a bit more. And what we get is a reinforcement of our initial testimony of a powerful 10th house with a powerful uh, moon in the 10th from the lot of fortune, again, signifying public and professional success. When both luminaries are in 10th house positions too, it can really shine a spotlight on the person since they're the light bringers. And the moon is increasing in light, so it has quite good light-bearing capacities and so on. Um, the other thing that's interesting, too, is that Venus, the, the lord of the tenth, or proper lord of the tenth, and lord of the bound of the moon, uh, is in an angle from the lot of fortune, which is uh, also very empowering. So once again, uh, we have some more tenth house empowering kinds of things, and we can you know, really dig into the 10th house through uh, these kinds of techniques and the confluence they're providing, or signatures, I should say, and the confluence they're providing. All right, folks, so that does it for this video. Um, stay tuned for possibly another one. And don't forget to hit like, subscribe, uh, find me on Facebook, share this video if you liked it, and check out my website for individualized readings and more. All right, guys, have a good one.